All right, uh, before we get started on the material today, I wanted to talk about some changes in the schedule that I just made, nothing super major. Um, first off, I moved, so the exam, I've updated it already on Canvas here, but I moved the exam from a week from today, so basically back a day, so it was supposed to be here, and then I shifted it back to that Friday, um, just in the interest of giving a little bit more time again between ending this unit and actually taking the exam, so you guys have some more time to study and kind of internalize the information. Um, and we're making, yeah, the progress we're making is fine. I mean, I think that's that makes perfect sense. I just kind of switch these two days. We'll do some review for exam four, along with getting into that last chapter that we're doing on um, the 28th of April. I just put the study guide up for the exam, so we have a week and a half with that. That is on Canvas. Um, and then, oh yeah, so I've had some questions about the final. Um, it is cumulative, so there will be mostly old information. The only chapter that's not on this last exam is chapter 15, the autonomic nervous system. So that's the only new material that'll be on, um, on the final exam. It's cumulative, it's in person. So we'll be taking it in the bio labs upstairs on May 10th at 10 a.m. I'll have a study guide for you guys for that. So I can hopefully narrow down a little bit more because uh, we've covered a lot of material, kind of narrow down what you should be focusing on studying. Along with that, so this day, the 5th of May, the last day of class I have set aside for review for final. I think what I'm gonna do that day is just bring all of your um, old exams. So I don't let you hold on to your exams. I'll bring them all so you can look through them. If you want to look at some questions you missed, um, I'll be pulling some questions off the old exams to make the final. And then we can also do, we, I can answer any questions you guys have about material on the final. Um, or if, if there's none of that and we have enough time, I'll do some kind of little like review quiz. So May 5th um, in class, so you guys, let's see, where are we here? So you guys will be in person that week again, the people who are here. So you guys on Zoom, normally you'd be on Zoom for May 5th. Um, if you wanna come in and see your exams, come in on May 5th and we'll meet elsewhere. I'll talk about that in the future so you can actually see your exams before you take the final. Okay, so that deals with our last exam, the final. Um, and that gets us through the end of the semester. Any questions about those changes? Yes. No, I'm going to try to, it'll be evenly divided among the questions. So it'll be 100 questions divided <laughs> as evenly as possible across all of them. So most of your exams are 50 questions. So it's just doubled, basically. Um, just doubled. I know it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. So no, I will. I usually go through and count for each unit. Like I try to divide up the chapters evenly too. So I'll do that for the final. So there won't even be like more new material on final. It'll be the same as all the other chapters. So it'll be 15 evenly divided sections. Good question. Okay, one other important announcement. I think everyone's kind of burnt out. And I know this is a lot of information. The cranial chapter is really intense. We're gonna do a good bit more of it today, um, get through a lot of the information. Um, and on that note, I've decided to cancel class on Friday. So there's no class for AMP this Friday, just to give you a little bit of a break, take kind of a mental health hour so you don't have to be thinking about AMP. We're making good progress on this material, so I'm not worried about having to cram more information in. Um, so this Friday, where we were going to continue on with the brain and cranial nerves, I'll just finish that on Monday. So the 23rd of April, no class. So do whatever you need to do at that point. If it's making up or taking more time to get your final outlines done, or if you haven't done some outlines, and you still want to turn them in, turn them in. Um, it'll be good studying for the final. Okay, good, good, okay. Oh, 
So now we're going to get back into chapter 14, the cranial anatomy chapter. All right. This is the slide we ended on um, on Monday. So I didn't get into cerebrospinal fluid or the ventricles. So we'll start there today. I'm sure you guys can see. Um, and then I'll be getting into like the different regions of the brain and talking about their functions. So some of the anatomy of them, but also kind of what they control. So first the cerebrospinal fluid, I think I've mentioned cerebrospinal fluid before. I'll tell you what the purpose of it is. But first I wanted to talk about where it is in the brain. It's primarily in what we call the ventricles of the brain, which you can see outlined here in blue. They're all interconnected and then they connect down to the spinal cord as well. Cerebrospinal fluid actually um, bathes the brain overall. I'll kind of show you that on a different diagram, but most of the cerebrospinal fluid is found within kind of the interior part of the brain and what we call ventricles. Um, at the bottom of each of those ventricles, there's something called the choroid plexus, which is basically just a bunch of capillaries or blood vessels. Um, it's kind of this spongy mass at the base of each of them. Um, so you can, you can't really tell it apart here, but this is a cross section of a brain. So we're looking down at the top. Yeah, so down from the top, cut a brain in half, looking down at it. So the choroid plexus would be just at the bottom of those ventricles. And this is where you'll find the cells that make the cerebrospinal fluid, essentially. Those cells are called ependymal cells. I mentioned these back in the nervous tissue uh, chapter. Um, these are a type of glial cell, which are those supportive cells in nervous tissue. So you have the neurons, which are the big ones in nervous tissue. Then you have all those little tiny cells surrounding them, those little dots. Those are the glial cells. This is one specific kind of glial cell. Um, some other examples are the ones like oligodendrocytes that make the myelin sheath. That's another type of glial cell. But these ependymal cells are the ones that are uh, producing the cerebrospinal fluid at the base of each of these ventricles. Ependymal cells. Um, so then what is cerebrospinal fluid? It's basically just this clear colorless um, liquid that surrounds the brain and then also bathes the spinal cord. So the entire central nervous system is bathed in the cerebrospinal fluid. And in your textbook, I don't, I don't ask you to know the process or the direction in which this flows. But if you're interested for some reason in your textbook, there's a good diagram as to how this actually um, flows around the brain and through the ventricles. But it flows like you can see all around the cerebrum, down around the cerebellum, into the spinal cord, back up um, into the main part of the brain. Okay, so why do we have cerebrospinal fluid? <laughs> what does it do? If it's clear and colorless, doesn't seem that important. Um, it's important for essentially three different functions dealing with the brain. A really important function is to basically allow the brain to be more buoyant. So our brain is relatively heavy and if it's sitting on the nervous tissue um, at the base of the brain and on the spinal cord, it would kind of kill that nervous tissue. So we don't want that to happen. So having the cerebrospinal fluid um, kind of as a, a buffer around that and helping to make it more, make the brain more buoyant 
helps to uh, protect that nervous tissue on the underside of the brain. So it allows for buoyancy. And kind of similar to that, it helps protect the brain from any kind of um, impact. So it's kind of like a cushion, so your brain doesn't directly hit the skull bones. It's not perfect. Concussions obviously still happen. There's only so much it can do, but um, a reasonable impact will be protect. Your brain will be protected from a reasonable kind of impact by the cerebrospinal fluid. And then finally, it's important, as you probably imagined, in balancing chemicals in the brain. So there's chemicals moving from the cerebrospinal fluid into the brain tissue and vice versa, taking metabolic waste away, bringing in new nutrients to that nervous tissue in the brain. On to something kind of related um, to that idea of this uh, liquid kind of bathing the brain, the blood supply to the brain and the brain barrier system. So I mentioned cerebrospinal fluid will bring in certain nutrients and get rid of metabolic waste. There's a barrier between that as well as blood that's um, in the capillaries around the brain that will allow certain materials to get to the nervous tissue, but we'll keep other materials from getting to it. So we don't want everything that's in our blood or in our cerebrospinal fluid getting to the nervous tissue in our brain. So there's a couple of different ways that um, the brain barrier system accomplishes this. As far as blood supply to the brain, blood obviously brings a lot of nutrients and important gases to the brain. The brain makes up about 2% of our body weight, but it takes up 15% of the blood. So it needs a lot of blood. It needs a lot of input of nutrients, um, primarily in a lot of ways to make ATP. So the neurons in the brain need a lot of ATP because ATP is the energy source for cells. And our brain does a lot of work, which means it needs a lot of ATP. In order to produce ATP, aerobically, which is the more efficient form of respiration, cellular respiration, you need oxygen and glucose. So glucose and oxygen both need to be brought into the brain um, in pretty high amounts to make enough ATP for it to function. And that comes in through the blood supply. An interruption to the blood supply to the brain, depending on how long it is, can have some minor impacts or really significant impacts. So just 10 seconds without blood coming to the brain, you can lose consciousness. After one to two minutes, it can significantly impair neural function, which there's, that's kind of a wide category, but one to two minutes, you're getting into a danger zone where there might be some irreversible damage if there's no blood making its way to the brain. And after just four minutes, which doesn't seem very long, um, after four minutes, there can be irreversible brain damage if there's not enough blood supply. So this kind of points out how important it is to get that blood to the brain quickly and constantly. So what is this brain barrier system? What are we trying to block out? I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the specific ions and chemicals that are blocked out, uh, but I'll kind of talk about how it works. So the brain barrier system is regulating what gets from the bloodstream into the tissue of the brain. hence the name barrier. It's a barrier between what's flowing through our blood and our veins and our brain tissue. 
essentially balancing the chemicals and the ions that are necessary for the brain to function. Too much or too little of anything in our body is pretty much not a good thing. And the same goes for our brain. So uh, the brain barrier system is how our body controls those, that balance of chemicals and ions. There's a couple different places where this brain barrier system um, is most active. Blood capillaries are found throughout the brain tissue. So all of the brain tissue is innervated by all these capillaries. So materials can move from those capillaries to the brain tissue. That's one area where the brain barrier system is engaged. And I'll show you kind of what that looks like. And then the capillaries of the choroid plexus, which I just talked about, that's that spongy mass of capillaries that's at the base of the ventricles. So those internal chambers in the brain, at the base of that, there's a lot of capillaries. So that's a really important area for the brain barrier system to work as well, or blood, yeah, brain barrier system, sorry. So I'll talk about each of these and kind of very, very briefly how they work. First, the blood brain barrier. Um, the blood brain, brain barrier is what <laughs> can, um, protects the nervous tissue uh, where you have all of that innervation, or sorry, um, vascularization of capillaries throughout the brain. So this is not at the choroid plexus. That's what I'll talk about on the next slide. So this is kind of all over the brain where you have blood vessels providing um, blood to the brain. All of the blood vessels are um, lined by what we call endothelial cells, which you can see here, just a special kind of cell um, that makes up the wall of these capillaries. So endothelial cells here, they sort of act as a gatekeeper. So you can imagine blood flowing through these capillaries. Certain materials will make their way out through the junctions between these cells, but only certain materials. So it will allow very specific ions and chemicals through those junctions from the blood out into the brain tissue and other stuff, it'll just keep in the capillaries, keep it moving along, and it won't contact the brain tissue. So the endothelial cells really are that gatekeeper that keeps certain substances from moving out of the capillary into the brain tissue. It's really easy to confuse endothelial with ependymal because of, well, they're weird words and they both start with an E. Um, so try to keep those straight in your head. Endothelial cells are lining the capillaries and creating this blood-brain barrier. Ependymal cells are the ones that are creating the cerebrospinal fluid. And then we have the blood CSF barrier, so blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier. This is what is found at the choroid plexus, at the base of those ventricles. So you can kind of see generally where this is in the brain. Um, same idea. We have cells that are now their ependymal cells. The ependymal cells are in that choroid, choroid plexus, not endothelial this time, but they are tightly joined together as well. So they're going to be tightly joined together. And they will also allow for the passage of certain materials while not allowing for the passage of other materials. So to and from kind of the, um, the cerebrospinal fluid into the blood and vice versa. So that's the blood CSF barrier. So you have blood brain and blood CSF, just two generally different locations. The list I have here um, is just a very, a very short list of some of the most important or I guess mo of mo chemicals of most interest that are highly permeable, that the brain barrier system is highly permeable to. So these molecules 
uh, basically move across this barrier system very easily. So they move from the blood to the brain quickly and easily. Water, probably a good thing. <laughs> we need a lot of water for our brain. Water, glucose, and oxygen, those are the two um, molecules that are really important for aerobic respiration, which means ATP production. So it's a good thing that the barrier system is permeable to them. Carbon dioxide, that's a waste product of aerobic respiration. So we wanna get that out. So that's moving more from the brain tissue to the blood to um, get it away from the brain. And then these last three, alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine are just a few examples of chemicals that a lot of us um, take in for one reason or another. And they affect our brain very quickly and very easily because they are, um, the brain barrier system is highly permeable to them. So alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine all move across this barrier very easily. Um, so we'll stick to caffeine, but caffeine, you have a cup of coffee and pretty quickly within, I don't know, 15 or not even 15 minutes, you're feeling the effects of caffeine because it moves across that brain barrier system really quickly. Same with alcohol and nicotine. So you feel that impact very quickly once you start taking, um, taking those uh, chemicals in. Okay, so that's the brain barrier system. Um, just kind of a pretty general, fairly general overview of how it works um, and what it does. Okay, now into some anatomy of the functional regions of the brain. So I broke down the brain at the beginning of this chapter, um, kind of on uh, locational, a locational basis. So we had the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. The functional regions of the brain, uh, now we're going to divide the brain up based on some functions that these different parts of the brain have in common. So slightly different from the locational breakdown, not a huge, it's not hugely important as long as you know what these different parts of the brain do. I'm not gonna ask you the functional versus like structural breakdown of the brain. Um, but this is how we're gonna go through these different regions of the brain talking about their functions, which we haven't really done. I don't think we've talked about much of the functioning of different parts of the brain yet. Different parts of the brain will control very different aspects of the overall functioning of our bodies. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. First, you have the forebrain, which is gonna be the cerebrum. Remember the cerebrum is this big part of the brain that we typically think of as the brain. So cerebrum, um, that's gonna include, uh, oh, sorry, the cerebrum and the diencephalon. Diencephalon I haven't talked about yet, I don't think. We'll get into what's included in the diencephalon. Uh, the midbrain which is just kind of on its own, doesn't really have any subparts to it right here. So the midbrain, and then the hindbrain is gonna be essentially the brainstem and the cerebellum. So you have the pons, medulla oblongata, and cerebellum, making up what we call the hindbrain. Um, I'm gonna go sort of backwards as we go through the slides. So I'm gonna talk about the hindbrain first, then the midbrain, then the forebrain. A little bit of anatomy about each of these parts, but also their functionality, what they control in our bodies. Okay, so first, down at the very bottom of what we consider the brain, the medulla oblongata, down here, it's a little bit wider than the spinal cord, but the spinal cord comes out right at the bottom of it. So it's directly connected to the spinal cord. Um, it, everything that comes from the spinal cord has to go up through the medulla. Everything that goes towards the spinal cord from the brain has to go through the medulla. All right. Here's some images, some sagittal sections showing the medulla. Right here, this would be the beginning of the spinal cord, so just up from the spinal cord. Like I said, all of the information that's being sent from the spinal cord up to the brain or brain down to the spinal cord and then out to the peripheral nervous system has to go through the medulla. It's kind of the gatekeeper. I know I keep using that term, but 
everything has to go through that to get to the brain. So the ascending and descending tracks that we talked about, they're all going through the medulla. Important functional centers that are found here in the medulla. Um, it's a fairly small part of the brain, but it controls some pretty important aspects, as you can see. So cardiac control. So it, it's not the only part of the brain that affects how our heart works, but it's a really important part of the brain that affects some um, aspects of uh, our cardiac functionality. Vasomotor, which just means dilation and constriction of blood vessels. So that is going to affect your blood pressure. So vasomotor effects and then respiratory. So our breathing. <laughs> so breathing, heart, blood vessels, pretty important stuff that the medulla oblongata actually controls. As we go through these different parts of the brain, you'll see a lot of overlap. So there will be other parts of the brain that control cardiac respiratory uh, functions. Um, so you'll see overlap and we'll also talk about specific regions that have kind of unrelated functions within one region. So kind of all possible combinations within the brain. That's why it's very complicated to learn about. All right, so I think that's all I have on the medulla. Yeah, then just up from there, so we're moving up a little bit, is the pons. It's an expanded, it's further expanded. It's a little bit bigger than the medulla oblongata below it. Um, it is, some of its functions include regulation of sleep, respiration again, so medulla and the pons deal with respiration, and then posture. So like I said, some of these functions even though it's just within this one kind of small part of the brain deals, the functions don't really seem linked at all. Posture, sleep, and respiration. Okay. That's all I'm going to talk about with the pawns. That's all you need to know about the pawns. Not a whole lot more detail um, than that. Moving to the cerebellum. So this is that um, cauliflower looking or kind of tree like section on the back of your skull. So under the back of your skull. So behind the brainstem, it's where the cerebellum is. Um, so yeah, back here for you guys on Zoom. The cortex, and remember the cortex um, is just the outer layer. So the outer portion of the cerebellum or the cerebrum, whichever we're talking about. Cortex that's out is that outer layer. In the brain, it's gray matter, which means that's where a lot of the decision making is happening. It's where the main neuron cell bodies are. So it's a very important part. That's on the outside, the cortex. Um, they call them in the cerebellum that cortex of gray matter. It kind of looks like leaves. So they call them folia. Those folds are referred to as folia, like foliage on a tree. So those are the folia. And then in the middle, you have the white matter, which is where all those axons are with the myelin sheets. Those are called these kind of interior what look like branches of the tree are called arbor vitae, which means uh, living tree. So here you have the arbor vitae, those branches, white branches. So I think just in the cerebellum, the gray matter and the white matter get those special names, the folia and the arbor vitae. As a reminder, this is the part of the brain. It's not very big, but it contains about 50% of the neurons in the brain. So it's a really important part of the brain. Um, and that adds up to 100 billion neurons just in the cerebellum. Functionality here, um, there's a lot, but the main aspects of the function of the cerebellum deal with motor coordination and locomotion. So movement in general. 
here are some more um, different views on an actual brain of the cerebellum. So you can see it's fairly small, especially compared to the cerebrum, um, right at the back, right behind the brain stem. And it has that different texture. So it has these really fine lines compared to the cerebrum, which has those bigger, thicker folds. So here's the cerebellum. And this is looking from underneath the brain. So looking kind of up at the bottom of the brain. And you can see the cerebellum is divided into two halves, just like the cerebrum is, so cerebellum. You'll see this view of the brain from underneath when we talk about the cranial nerves. So these are all cranial nerves coming off of here. We won't get to that till Monday. But you'll see that view of the brain plenty coming up. Okay. That is the cerebellum. Onto the midbrain. The midbrain doesn't, um, for our purposes, have, well, it has some kind of subsets within it, but not any major ones like I just mentioned um, with the other couple or the hindbrain. So we're moving into the midbrain now. So we have the hindbrain, which was pons, medulla, and cerebellum. The midbrain is this kind of smallish area right here, just above the pons. So yeah, midbrain circled. It's going to connect the hindbrain and the forebrain. That's why it's mid, right in the middle. It is a small area, but it's kind of complicated as far as the anatomy goes. So there's there's four bulges basically at the top. So if we're looking over here, this is going to be the midbrain area. Below here we have the pons and the medulla oblongata. This is going to be our midbrain, and there's these four kind of nodules sticking off of it. So for you guys on Zoom. Here we're looking at the midbrain and those four bulges or nodules are called the corpora quadragemina. The upper pair of those have different functions or control different functions than the lower pairs. So you have the, what we call the superior colliculi. So the two pairs are divided into superior and inferior colliculi. So the two on top are the superior, Two on bottom, obviously the inferior colliculi, and they have very different functions, or they control very different functions, I should say, of our of our body. The superior colliculi are important in a lot of visual aspects. Um, so visual attention, as well as like tracking moving objects. So being able to follow a moving object is controlled here in the superior colliculi of the midbrain, and then some reflexes also. The uh, inferior colliculi are sort of con um, receiving information from the inner ear. And remember, the inner ear is really important in balance. So this helps to keep us upright and balanced. So visual versus balance, basically, the superior versus inferior colliculi. And then one more important aspect of the midbrain is where it connects to, basically the, connects the cerebrum to the brainstem. So because it's the midbrain, it kind of helps connect these different aspects. Those are called the cerebral peduncles, which is a funny word. So here you can see this would be one of the peduncles. This would be the other one. Um, so that's just helping anchor the cerebrum, which is the most superior part of the brain, to the brainstem below it. So just really a structural aspect, keeping everything, everything together. Okay, I think that's all I have about the midbrain. And next I want to talk about something called the reticular formation before we move on to the forebrain. So the reticular formation is not a specific part of the brain. It's really just this 
It's an interconnected network of neurons that reach throughout all parts of the brain and basically send information from say the hindbrain to the forebrain or the midbrain to the hindbrain, et cetera. So technically it's a web of gray matter. So gray matter is making a lot of those decisions, sending more information kind of out to the edges or back down to the spinal cord. Um, so there's a lot of connections between the different parts of the brain through this reticular formation. And I'll talk about the specific aspects of our functioning that, is, that are controlled by the reticular formation. But just think of it as this network, network of connected nervous tissue. The functions of this network uh, include somatic motor control, so just controlling your skeletal muscles and how you move. A lot of aspects of muscle tension, so maintaining balance, tone, posture, body movements in general, so general motor control. It also sends signals from the eyes and the ears to the cerebellum, cerebellum. So it has a sensory function. So it takes in the senses, takes in sights and sounds, sends that information to the cerebellum for it to process. And then kind of similar to the first bullet point, motor coordination. So not just being able to move, but being able to move in a coordinated way. And then it's also back to cardiovascular. Obviously cardiovascular is pretty important. So there's a lot of different aspects of the brain that control cardiovascular function. The reticular formation is another part of the brain that's really important in controlling cardiovascular function. And then finally, it controls how much pain we feel in a lot of ways. It's not the only pain modulation part of the brain. Uh, but it will send pain signals through some of the ascending tracts that we talked about. So it'll send that information up to the cerebrum, for example, but it will also send uh, kind of pain killing messages back down through the descending tracts. These are called analgesic pathways, which I've mentioned before. So these will block pain signals. Sometimes pain isn't helpful to us. Um, so our body will kind of tamp down the pain signals that are being sent um, back out and block that pain. So pain modulation is a really important part of the reticular formation. And then also a couple more, sleep and consciousness. So the ability to be awake or be asleep is controlled in a lot of ways by this reticular formation. If there's some kind of injury to the reticular formation, it can result in basically never waking up again, an irreversible coma. <clears throat> and then the last category I have here, habituation. This just means getting used to the many, many, many stimuli that are basically bombarding our senses uh, throughout the day or night. So the reticular formation kind of gets rid of all the noise so we can focus on really important stimuli versus all of these other stimuli that are constantly coming at us that are not important. So it gets, it gets rid of all of that, those extra stimuli that we don't really need to pay attention to, but that are still kind of bombarding our senses. That's what the habituation function of the reticular formation has to do with. If our brain had to deal with all of the stimuli that was coming at it constantly, it would be completely overwhelmed if it had to actually um, process all of that information. Okay, so that's the reticular formation. On to the last 
functional part of the brain, the forebrain. So now we're talking about most of the volume of the brain and the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is this most superior part of the brain. And then we also include something called the diencephalon in this forebrain. It has some similar functions to the cerebrum, so we group them together. And that's kind of right here, right in the middle, kind of middle lower part of the cerebrum area. Okay, the diencephalon has three major parts, all some kind of thalamus. So there's the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Those are what make up the diencephalon. These are really important in um, a lot of endocrine functions. So uh, I'll talk about this when I get to the hypothalamus in particular, but very important in controlling the release of hormones. So the endocrine system and the nervous system are very closely linked. The diencephalon is the main area where they're linked and interact. So first the thalamus, I'm not gonna talk about the functionality of the epithalamus. So we're just gonna do thalamus and hypothalamus, just know the name of the epithalamus. So the thalamus is this kind of egg-shaped or ovoid mass at the upper end of the brainstem. It's called the gateway to the cerebral cortex. And remember the cortex is kind of the outer layer of the cerebrum. So it's gonna filter information that's on its way up to that cerebral cortex. It's really important in motor control. So we've seen a bunch of different parts of the brain that are important in motor control, right? Our movements are very important. So there's thankfully different parts of the brain that control that. So if one part of the brain is injured, um, you may not lose total motor control functionality. Um, if another part of the brain can kind of take over. So that redundancy can be helpful in that sense. It's also really important in memory, which we talked about some, and then also emotion. So how you feel your emotions. Okay, on the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about, oh no, wait, sorry, we were talking about the thalamus. I'm gonna talk about the hypothalamus um, after I show you an image here, kind of where they are. So we're talking right below the cerebrum here, the thalamus, that it's kind of egg-shaped, like I said, a little egg-shaped. The hypothalamus, hypo means below, so it's kind of below and in front of the thalamus. So here would be the thalamus, and then the hypothalamus is here in orange. So yeah, thalamus is that egg-shaped thing in the center, and then the hypothalamus is kind of just below it and anterior. The hypothalamus um, is the part that's particularly linked to the endocrine system. So it has a lot of functionality over controlling our autonomic nervous system, which I haven't gotten into, uh, but it's the unconscious part of our nervous system that regulates a lot of our bodily functions that we don't have to think about. So here now the brain is flipped. So this is the anterior portion. So the hypothalamus would be right here. And then here's the thalamus. I'm going to go into a little more detail about what the hypothalamus does because it is so incredibly important in a lot of endocrine functionality. We haven't really talked about the endocrine system, but you generally know what it does. So the hypothalamus is gonna control hormone secretions primarily through the pituitary gland. We haven't really talked about many glands. This is one you want to know, the pituitary gland. It regulates a lot of different things. So growth, metabolism, reproduction, any kind of response to stress hormones for labor contractions, hormones for lactation, and then also water conservation in the body. So the hypothalamus is controlling the pituitary gland, which is controlling all of these other functions. So it's kind of the ultimate control behind a lot of these autonomic functions. And then other autonomic effects beyond what's controlled by the pituitary gland, 
It influences our heart rate, blood pressure, and then also uh, our digestion through gastrointestinal secretions. It helps regulate your body temperature, your hunger. So if you don't realize when you're hungry or don't realize when you're full, maybe your hypothalamus is to blame. So food and water intake is regulated by the hypothalamus. And then sleep, which I'll talk about um, probably on, yeah, on Monday. Memory and emotional behavior. So, so many different functions that the hypothalamus actually controls. This one small part of the brain has really wide reaching effects. Okay. And then the cerebrum. The cerebrum, I'm actually, ironically, not going to spend all that much time on, considering it's the biggest part of the brain. Um, there's a lot that goes into the cerebrum. I just think it's a bit much to ask you guys to remember all of the functionality of all of the lobes. Um, this is the information I want you to know on the next slide. It's kind of optional for your information information, I guess is a way to say it. So the cerebrum is going to be the largest part of the brain. It's involved in a lot of different aspects of our functioning. Sensory perception. So all of the major senses are going to be processed here in the cerebrum. Uh, memory, thought, that's a pretty broad category. <laughs> Judgment. So making good decisions versus bad decisions. That's controlled in the cerebrum. And then again, voluntary motor actions. So more motor control functionality here in the cerebrum. I've talked about the two hemispheres at the beginning of this chapter, but there's the right and left cerebral hemisphere. It's divided, those are divided by the longitudinal fissure. Now each hemisphere has five lobes within it. We'll talk about these lobes and I'll have you identify where they are generally in lab. And here, like I said, the next slide, this is really what I want you to know about the cerebrum. Um, for lecture, yeah, for lecture, that's all you need to know. This is, it's interesting to think about all of the different functions of the cerebrum. Each lobe has a lot of different functions, but they're kind of separated. Some of them overlap. Uh, some of them are unique to one lobe, but here is an outline of essentially what different functions are controlled by different parts of the cerebrum. So you have these five different lobes, mostly named for the bone that they're under. So frontal, parietal, occipital, that should all look pretty familiar. Um, so your decision making, so any decisions you make, emotional control, that's all controlled by the frontal lobe. Um, the parietal lobe has a lot of uh, sensory information intake. The occipital lobe is really important in vision. So the back side of your head is really important in any kind of visual processing. Uh, the temporal lobe can be really important in uh, verbal language skills, that kind of thing. So it's interesting. It's just a lot of information and I think you guys have enough to deal with without knowing this, but it's there for your information if you want it. And then we'll stop there today and finish up on Monday. So remember, no class Friday, and I'll see you on Monday.